Nigeria is bleeding. Nobody is safe again, says ex Jukawa governor Alhaji Sule Lamido. And mass expulsion looms as the APC goes tough on litigants while a crisis in Enugu APC causes uh, a former speaker and ex governor to be expelled. Interesting. Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anna Kong. I guess the big question tonight is, is anyone really safe in Nigeria? Because the former governor of Jigawa State, Alhaji Sule Lamido, certainly thinks not. He lamented the high spate of insecurity in the country, saying that Nigeria is bleeding. Lamido added that no one is safe in the country. He also said that former President Olusegun Obasanjo had reinforced his faith in the country despite the appalling situation. Now, during the course of the year, several leaders and other family members have suffered attacks. A most recent example is a murder of the son of Senator Bala Na'ala by a known gunman. Earlier in June this year, Kano State Governor Abdullahi Ganduje and his Jigawa State counterpart, Muhammad Baduru, uh, had narrowly uh, escaped being attacked by bandits on a highway linking Zamfara and Kano State. Well, joining us to discuss this is Terence Koanum. He's a security expert and Shagun Shopiton, who is a, a good governance advocate. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Great. Um, I'm going to start with you, Terence, because um, it's, it, it, it now sounds more like Unless, I don't want to make it sound like we're, we don't value what, you know, the lives of people that are dying, uh, the lives that are being lost every day. But it sounds more like music, because every day we're saying this person is kidnapped, 100 people were killed. Uh, it's just now numbers. But when you hear no one is safe in Nigeria, is, is, does it sound a bit over-exaggerated or is it our reality today? Yeah, no one is safe in Nigeria, and it's a reality. Uh, but the good news at the moment is that people that have given the interest that the security people have needed all along to be able to tame this bandit and this terrorist from the bush have started coming up. Uh, because in time past, we have seen people like Governor Otto have cried out that the people that are killing him and his people are free full of these people. Uh, but there were politics that was involved in the whole process. But of recent, we have seen the governor of Patina State, who has come out to, to openly confess that the people who are killing people are fellow full of people like him, are from the same ethnicity, and that they know them. Now, if we have very serious security people in this country, it means that we have had enough interest be able to go after this because the governor has told the country that they know the people that are attacking them. They will have the likes of the Bumi that have come out to tell us that they are coming face to face to meet this band. And, so, and they will have the Miyaji Allah group that have not their own claim. So we expect the security people to have stood on to this intel and be able to save these people in the bush once and for all. Because now the bandits and the unknown government, they have faces now. And so it's for them to be able to go out and get them. And another issue that we have been singing like a song is the use of technology. Because we know that we have a lot of ungoverned faces in this country, and we know that the forest they are talking about, these people who find them, they are part of our ungoverned faces. With security, you can be able to track these people exactly at their location, or the effort to be able to hit them from those locations. So, everything we are facing in this country is by the largesty of the political leadership and our security system because we have enough inter at the moment now to be able to make Nigeria at least have a sigh of relief. Hmm. Now, there have been calls uh, asking that Nigerians defend themselves. And this is not the first. Um, I mean, the Katsina state governor has said it. 
the defense minister has said it. Afeni Ferrer has said it. I mean, literally everybody's calling for Nigerians to take up arms and defend themselves against terrorists when we have security agencies. And now you have also pointed to the fact that well, there seems to be too much of politicizing this security issue, and that's why we are where we are. Don't forget also that, on the other hand, uh, we have so-called repentant terrorists who, who have come to say that they're sorry and want to be reintegrated into society. And the army, of course, has its plate full, having to deal with debriefing them and knowing whether they can be brought back into society or not. That's on the one hand. And then you have people like the governor of Benue State who's saying that the federal government is not dealing with this issue as it should be dealt with. So I'm asking, um, what exactly do we tell people who are on the receiving end of this banditry, this, this brutality, because they're losing families, they're losing loved ones. They, I mean, even our soldiers who have lost their comrades, uh, you know, in, in the line of battle. What do we tell them? Because it seems like there's so many voices, but there's not one voice telling us exactly what we need to do or what direction we should go in. The, the, the only reprieve you give to an average Nigerian is to make sure that you go into the bushes and offer the political leadership that will be able to end this fight. We have lost a lot of citizens that we cannot even count. We have lost a lot of security people that we cannot even count. None, nobody is safe in this country, no highway is safe in this country at the moment. So the only thing that can give people a little sigh of relief is to be able to tame these terrorists that we know. We know people that have come out to say that these people, they know who brought them. There is a lot of people that is flying left, right and center in the north. So it is for the political leadership to be able to lead the security personnel properly for them to tame them. You cannot even you cannot even bring these people from the bush and begin to talk of amnesty. People who are discussing amnesty, how have you been able to resolve with the communities that have been affected? People that these people know have been killing them, you want to integrate them to be operating with them, how are they going to feel clean with them? So amnesty first starts with the resolution of the community, and then secondly, you need to have a program of reintegration into the site. I know we don't even know what they have done, these people, that they are releasing them back to the society. And remember, the first time that this issue took place, we came back to realize that the same person that was reintegrated into the society went and led an attack and ambushed our military personnel, and we lost very senior military personnel in that direction. The other time, somebody that was reintegrated went and killed his family and took away the cows from the family. And now, this program has not been successful. It is not about bringing people to integrate into the society. And we also know that amnesty has been given all over the world, but it is the process. It is not something you just wake up one day and go and bring somebody who has been killing Nigerians all along and want to reintegrate into the society. It doesn't work that way. So I think they should follow the rule of law and they should be able to work with Nigeria and work with the Asian and Nigerian are giving them so that they can be able to end this. They know what this evening, the, the Department of Self Security have said that the leaders of Boko Haram are now residing in Saudi Kaduna. So if there's a security report that the, the leaders of Boko Haram are residing in this place, what is stopping the security system to boom Saudi Kaduna? And six thousand people. Hmm. So these are the, the challenge we are having is that with all the aid we are getting from the people that are affected, the security people are doing nothing about it. It obviously means that there is a problem in the political leadership. Okay. So if anybody indicts the security leadership to be public, the person is right, and that is why I agree with the governor of Tennessee. Okay, let me move to Shagun. Shagun. Um, this evening, I was just watching the news and I, I saw a story um, about Mieti Ala. But before we go to that, let's backpedal a bit. Um, we see the situation of things as it is right now. And, and you and I were just, you know, chit-chatting before the show began. Um, there, we want to know exactly. I mean, we all are saying the same thing, that there is some level of insecurity more unusual than it used to be. 
Uh, I want to I ask why you think he has deteriorated to this point. Who's responsible for the deterioration when he did start? Um, what kind of push and um, energy was, were we getting from security agencies in collaboration with federal government to deal with this issue? And who's responsible for why he has gotten this bad? Uh, when, you, when you're done answering that question, we'll go to the Mieti Ala issue. Okay. <clears throat> All right, Marianne. Um, you know, you said some things now that I think we need to interrogate. Um, one of the things that I've always tried very, very hard to do um, um, as far as the national, national issues and the national narrative is concerned is I try to um, avoid... Uh, what I would call the bandwagon, and I and and I try to interrogate issues as much as possible, and I try to make sure that whatever I am saying is evidence based, right? Um, so so, you know, you hear um, um, you know the headline, uh, and headlines are you know they're newsmakers, they're click click um, attractors, and they're 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 paper sellers, right? So you hear the headline, and it's very attractive. But, but if you look um, be, be beyond the headline and actually look through, dig into the numbers, and the numbers are there for anybody that is really interested, you find that perhaps we may be playing a dangerous game of playing into the hands of, the, of our enemies um, with all of this narrative that we drive, Marianne. So now what do I mean by this? Um, Boko Haram are a terror organization. And what do terrorists do? They create terror. They scare people. They want people to be afraid to live their normal lives. They want people to be so afraid that they defer to them. Um, the bandits are terrorists. Whatever name you give them, their their stock in trade is to kidnap people and create enough fear of death so that they can then make, uh, in their own case, economic gain from from there. And you can go on and on, you know, about that. So. It would appear as though, as a result of political um, uh, dispositions and leanings, we have played very, very nicely into the hands of these people by, by perhaps running a narrative that may not be backed by evidence. What do I mean by this, Marianne? So while I was preparing to, 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 to speak with you this evening, I just looked for these numbers. And, you know, it, it's sort of shocking what the numbers are saying. The numbers are saying the exact opposite of what um, that headline is suggesting. Now, am I saying that um, everybody's safe? No. Am I saying that um, lives are not being lost every day? No. Am I even saying that things have not gotten worse in a particular way? No. You know, it's it's all there. You can read the headlines every day, and people are dying. You know, kidnap kidnap incidents are high. But when you take a holistic view of where we've been coming from and where we are now, and you break and you disaggregate the numbers that you are looking at, things have actually gotten better. I, I mean, I, I know that this doesn't play to the narrative that... Yeah, of course. I, I understand where you're going. Yeah. Yeah, I understand, yeah. but I'm going to wait for you to get there. Yeah, so, so things have, have actually gotten better. And, I, and I'm, as I'm talking to you right now, I'm looking at numbers. I'm, I'm looking at a graph, a chart of, um, um, uh, from the Nigeria Security Tracker. And they have information about the various, the three major um, armed groups that are responsible for um, deaths in Nigeria. It's the Boko Haram. Um, there's a group they call uh, uh, Boko Haram. Then there's the sectarian actor, as they call them, which would include uh, the bandits and the herdsmen. And then they have um, other, you know, armed actors. Yeah, you can put, if you like, you can put the herdsmen in that category. Um, then state actors. And you find that, um, the Boko Haram incidents have collapsed. It's it's actually it's it's shocking. So I'm looking at a graph where the the trajectory of the graph since 2000 and um, since 2000 and uh, uh, it it peaked in 2015, middle of 2015. There was a peak in 2014, and then there was a peak in 2015. But since then, the number of incidents have continued to decline into until we have, you know, into August 2021, right? So in, on the Boko Haram front, things have actually gotten better. Um, for other incidents, there have been increases over the last couple of months. 
um, there was a peak um, on you know, in, in the overall, sorry, in the overall deaths per month in the overall. And it's sad that we've reduced, you know, these are human lives we're talking about. So it's very, very sad. But, you know, the conversation must be had regardless. Um, the peak, the highest number of deaths per month that we've had in recent times was in um, August, uh, April 2020. And then since April 2020, it has declined until it went slightly up again um, until the end of 2021. And then from April 2021 till now, it's been on a decline. Now, this is from the Nigerian Security Tracker. This is not my opinion. Um, I also saw an article on Premium Times just now that was saying that the number of deaths has declined from last week. You know, they do a weekly tracker, right? And uh, the number of incidents last week was much less, much fewer, significantly fewer than the one the week before. Okay, so, so this Jackson, let me come in because I was really waiting for you to hit the point. I totally get where you're coming from and I, and I, and, and I, I understand and I support that. The numbers are declining because we're here with facts, we're here with figures. But shouldn't one life be valuable enough for us to move heaven and earth to make sure that... I, I asked the question yesterday to one of my guests. We keep spending monies. People are doing GoFundMes and starting all kinds of schemes to try to, make, to get monies to pay for ransoms, even though those things don't make the news. Um, and so I asked, why do we have to spend so much money, time and energy to try to retrieve these abductees uh, instead of devoting the same time, energy and money to make sure that it doesn't even happen in the first place. I totally understand that it's being reduced. It's marginally getting better. But why can we not do the needful, put, not put the cart before the horse, deal with the situation so it doesn't keep reoccurring? Because, for example, Kaduna State, just like uh, Kwanam said, now we hear, according to Intel, that Boko Haram has moved base to Kaduna State. And don't also forget that Kaduna has become a playing ground for these bandits. So you keep hearing about more and more abductions. It's, it's like a game for them because, you know, maybe it's a money-making scheme of sorts. Why can't we not put a stop to it so that it doesn't even okay. happen? This is my question. Great. Absolutely, Marianne, and you are spot on, and I agree with you 100%. So let me, let me land on my previous points. The way I was going with that previous point was to simply say that um, um, Sule Lamido's accession uh, um, is scaremongering and it's politics, and we have to call it out for what it is. Um, it plays into the hands of the enemies, and we must not allow it, right? So to say that nobody is safe in Nigeria anymore is figurative, yeah. Yes, in a sense, in a manner of speaking, we, we can accept that, in a manner of speaking, but it's not true. So we have to say that because we must remember that these guys are politicians and they have an interest behind everything that they do. Do you know where he went to visit and where he was coming from, right? So that's, that's where I was going with that. And I was just trying to back that up with the okay. numbers. Now, to the point that you've made, and I think this is very key, um, um, it's absolutely critical that we, 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 we demand, uh, and I use that word deliberately, that we demand better action from our government at the federal level and at the state level with regards to the continued incidents of kidnapping, um, banditry, um, you know, it's, it's all over the place. Even in the Southwest, you know, everybody's a bit careful about wanting to travel by road. Thank God that there is a rail between Lagos and Ibadan. Now people are using that a lot, you know. It, it, it's, it's, it's critical that we insist that government should deploy more resources and more will. It's not a matter of the resources, in fact, and Marianne, and that's the point. So we spend all of this money paying bandits ransom. Why can't we spend that money on equipping the military, the state security services for intelligence gathering, the police, the national, you know, the NC, uh, uh, civil defense, you know, and the other security agencies to work together and, 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 and crush these guys. Look, the might of the Nigerian state, if deployed with sincerity, these guys can't stand it. So clearly, something is not right with the way this banditry issue has gone. You know, there's obviously some foul play somewhere. There's obviously some collaboration somewhere. There's obviously some sabotage somewhere. You know, so I think it's important that Nigerians do more 
um, um, by way of demanding that these things be brought under control than we're currently doing. And one of the ways to do that is to... I'm going to come back to you on that issue of Nigerians pressing home their demands, but let me go to Kwanem. Kwanem, yesterday the Middle Belt Forum had asked the federal government to um, name and shame those that... Uh, were named by the UAE and, of course, even within Nigeria. Uh, don't, don't forget there was a UN report about even the federal government it, it implicated federal, the members or people who work within the executive in the federal government uh, of sponsoring, you know, the insecurity in the country. And the Middle Belt Forum was asking uh, that the federal government name and shame these people if we really are truly uh, ready to put an end to the insecurity that we're facing in the country. But, of course... Um, the average person is wondering why the government is dragging its feet on this issue. As we speak, the UAE has paraded or has put out names of six Nigerians they think are financing terrorism in Nigeria. Uh, but then in Niger the, the, country which, the country in which we're feeling the pain, we're the ones who are wearing the shoe, we're the ones who are having people being kidnapped, we're the ones who are children are being taken from schools, we're yet to do the needful. And I'm wondering why, from a security perspective, is there a reason why we're keeping this under wraps or hush hushing it? Terence, can you hear me? Uh, Terence, are you there? Can you hear me? Uh, I think I'm going to sh throw the question back to Shagun because I cannot, I think we lost Terence. Um, Shagun, did you hear my question? Yeah, yeah, I, I heard your question. Let's see if you can attempt it, yes. Yeah, so, you know, from, from a, I mean, I can't give you a perspective from a security point of view since yeah. I'm not. Terence will do that. Yeah. But, but as someone who's, uh, you know, advocating for fair play in Nigeria. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so, so the, 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 the question is, um, I think what we need to do, I mean, I can't even answer that question because it, it, it's befuddling, you know, it's, it's totally confusing to, to, to you know, to, to understand why more is not being done. You know, I think, you know, the point I was trying to make earlier was the Nigerian state can obviously do more than we're doing with regards to these things. Um, before um, a kidnap happens, Marianne, it is planned. It is planned and there are there's a there's a there's a there's a you know reasonably wide net of people that will be involved in that planning right so your intelligence um, uh, society the intelligence community need to do more you know i mean what happened to to um sniffer devices that can listen in on conversations you know what happened to the fact that we know that there are people um highly placed people in society, who knows where these guys are? How come we can't send some sort of um, uh, maybe satellite-driven, um, 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 uh, what's it called now, listening device to hear the conversations and prevent the kidnaps? We know these things exist. We have the money to spend. Why spend the money paying ransom when you can actually seek the help of people with the technology required and yeah. sniff out these guys and prevent the kidnaps from happening? You know, so it's like somebody somewhere okay. is either benefiting from this or is too lazy to, to go out, uh, you know, to go after it in the right way, or perhaps there are other interests and forces at play that, that sort of checkmates whatever effort the security services are making. We don't know. Well, you know but, we well, well, these are the million dollar questions that are begging for answers, but I think we've got Terence back. Terence, can you hear me? Uh, we lost him again. Okay. Um, so, I, I mean, we have to move on with this conversation because we're almost out of time. I, I, yeah. I, I want to ask you this question. Um, a Niger Delta chieftain, we all know, uh, Robert Clack, uh, recently um, was quoted to ask for military intervention uh, in the country um, as to the situation that we're facing. Um, of course, another highly placed uh, government official has asked for him to come and explain to us. But I'm trying to understand, we're in a democracy. We, we democratically elected our leaders into office. And we also have tools in which we can explore to bring these people to account. Although some of those tools have been taken away from us, like protests, we're not allowed to protest. 
And uh, so it, there seems to be a thin line between a democratic dispensation and being under a military rule. So I'm asking, is there any grounds for Mr. Clark asking for the military to intervene in a democratic dispensation? Is that really what we need? Uh, would that be able to save the situation? Or is that just preposterous, outrightly? I mean, look, I, it's, you know, when I heard that, he said it a while back. I don't know if he said it again. But when I heard that, I was shocked. I was shocked to my bone marrows because, you know, except if you are too young to remember, you know, if you live through it, you can't ask for it. Um, um, so I wasn't too young during Abacha's reign. I was I was old enough to experience Buhari's first coming and um, uh, Babangida after him and Abacha. And I tell you that it's a reign of terror. Uh, for the young people who think that this government is repressive, and, and I'm not saying they're not, you know, but for the young people who think this government is repressive, you need to have lived through those periods of military rule. You see, because the military guy does not have any check or balance. It is gone. You know, so if he tells you do this, you've got to do it. And, you know, how dare you? You can't oppose him. If you do, then you pay with your life. So um, it's even, and, and remember, like you said, we're in a democracy. So we have to find the will within us to fight the fight using the what democratic What is that way? Because we keep saying we still have to find a way. And, and, and I said I was, I yeah. promised I was going to take you up on us pressing home our demands. How do we press home our yes. demands? I'm, I'm curious because um, if we cannot protest, we cannot also go to a venting ground, yeah. which is Twitter. Yeah. What are we left to? Which other tools can we explore to get our leaders to be accountable? Maria, we can not protest, and people people have been protesting. People protested yesterday. Uh, people are still protesting. There is no law that says you can't protest. Such a law doesn't exist. And I think it's important that we continue to remind ourselves of these things because, it, again, like I said, there's a lot of stuff going around in the national narrative that is simply not true. We can't protest, and we need to do more of it. What happened with NSAS was a precursor for what can happen, and we've got to do that again. No, so so. The How many fear, people are you going to be able to convince to do that again when the other time they presumably wanted to come out to to do something yeah, similar? The I police know. was picking up everybody mm -hmm. randomly. Who wants to go to a police I know. cell? I know. You, for I know. people who cannot afford it, today's today's Nigeria, a lot of people. I mean, how much is the dollar? It's fifty five hundred and forty naira, if I'm not mistaken. If you cannot five afford 15. a three a three square square meal uh, in Nigeria. Can you afford to pay for bail that is supposedly free if a policeman takes you into custody because you went out to protest? Yeah, I understand, Miriam. Uh, the point is, protest is one of the ways to demand accountability, um, um, advocacy, um, lobbying, um, uh, civil disobedience, lawsuits. There are so many of them. And I still insist, Miriam, that we are not, as Nigerians, doing enough. Um, it's, you know, it's not entirely our fault, you know, like you said, there are so many mitigating factors, the poverty, you know, in the country is ridiculous. I mean, and when we say poverty, even the middle class is poor. The Nigerian middle class is still survivalist, you know, in, 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 in general outlook. So I, I do understand what you're saying, but I'm just saying that we can't ask for military rule. Trust me, you don't want that. Um, if, if you, once you've experienced it, then you will know that <laughs> this is just a joke. Right. So okay. so if we can't ask for military rule, then the only other alternative available to us is to explore the democratic instruments that are available. And we can't get tired of it. They want you and I to get tired, Marian. They want us to tell ourselves that we can't protest. They want us to tell, tell ourselves that, oh, Twitter has been banned. We can't talk. They want us to say that we can't come on TV like this and, and say our mind. Nobody is ever going to muzzle me. I'm going to say what I'm thinking. They can't stop us, Miriam, but they will try to push a narrative to say that we can be stopped. And if we allow that, then they've won. So, okay. we, I, I, you know, so I, I think I'll, I'll leave it there, you know, but we can do more. Well, uh, on that note, I want to say thank you. Uh, Shegun Shopitan is of ACT Network, and uh, uh, he's been talking with us alongside uh, Koanum Terence, but then we lost connection with Terence. Thank you very much for being part of the conversation. Thank you for having me, Miriam. All right. Thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a short break. And when we return, we will be discussing the ruling APC and speculations that there might be a mass expulsion within the party, as well as crisis in Inugu APC. We'll be right back.